first question is for Estrada Meriam. So it says, how do I build my confidence to put my face on social media? I have studied Islam and counseling. I have so many things I would love to share so I could also connect with like-minded people. I feel like I learned so much yet only have a minimal friends to share with. When I share, I feel amazing. I also want to have the right intention and have been told that I could attract the Ain. Uh, so am I, you know, she doesn't want to obviously be a target for Ain. Can you give her some advice about being in the public eye and avoiding the eye, perhaps? Um, just being, using social media for good and how to kind of a, a check your intention. When I first joined social media, it was because I wanted to make da'wah to a cohort that I was part of and just help them see the beauty of Islam. Um, in that time, I never put my face up and I was just like, absolutely, I would never put anything related to my person online. Um, and I just want to share with you this development because I think it's important for us to think about all the different aspects if anyone's doing public work. Uh, over time, uh, as I was giving lectures, some of my lectures were shared online. And so slowly, my, my, my face is online more and more because people are sharing the lectures. Uh, and then eventually, I started getting messages from sisters who were really struggling with being a visible Muslim. Just very, very, very hard. There was an era, an era in which a lot of social media influencers who had established hijab um, companies and who had been kind of like the pillars of, um, you know, in, encouraging hijab were going through a difficult time and removing their hijab. And may Allah bless all of them. And hijab is a very, you know, difficult subject in so many ways. Um, so in that time, I was getting so many questions related to just hijab and being public and all of that. And so I started to ask my teachers and um, the, pe the people who mentor me, scholars who mentor me, about how to help women see themselves in different areas. And one of the pieces of advice that I kept receiving was they need to see other Muslim women who are in different spaces. It's one thing to see, you know, um, flowers with a caption, um, and it's another thing for them to see someone who they can relate to. And I have to say that it's, I am physically, like, I don't post my picture unless there's a reason. I don't have, like, it's, it's a personal choice. I just, I don't have, like, some photo shoots of myself, like, at the beach and respectfully to anyone who does it. That's just not my style. I try to make sure that what I post is with an intention that it's showing other women or it's talking about an aspect of character. That's a personal thing. Videos, I've talked to Dr. Haitha about in the past. The style of social media right now is videos are here. And it was something I really struggled with because when I did take a video from, you know, like that pillar over there, um, people just felt like they couldn't connect to it. And I would get that feedback. And I want to say that I really dislike being social on social media. I hate having my picture on social media. I hate being in videos on social media. I would completely leave social media if it wasn't for the messages that I receive, specifically from women who talk about how just seeing the visibility has made an impact on their lives. And it's not because I'm actually doing anything good or because I'm worthy of that. It's just literally sometimes someone needs to see someone else to feel like there's community and they just feel that community. And so when I'm sharing with you this advice, I'm sharing it from a place of hating being public. I don't like to be public, and I wouldn't encourage someone to be public, not because it's not helpful. I've told Dr. Rania to get a TikTok. I asked Dr. Haifa to get a TikTok. I think... all of us onto TikTok. Okay. Put the camera in our faces, literally. Let me just say, I told everyone, but two of them actually did it. So what that says about them, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Some of them are the chosen. I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. Um, TikTok is a beast. <laughs> but the people on TikTok are you young people. And the types of messages that they're hearing on there are from people who know nothing about Islam, who have 500,000 followers, and who are like, women, you are the majority of hell. And I'm like, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. This is what young people in high school and in college are hearing about Islam. 
then their rea reality that they're living is so supportive. Be whoever you want, be whatever you want, flaunt what you got, everything you want, you're accepted. But in the Muslim community, no, absolutely, don't be whoever you, no, hide everything about your existence because it's better for a woman not to exist in the first place. And that, that message is really hard for a young person who's struggling to figure out what their identity is. And so why I'm telling you all of this, because the benefit of being on social media, I have seen it, I'm sure anyone here, Dr. Anya, Dr. Haifa, anyone else, oh, Sada Husai, why didn't I see you, Sada Husai? Sada Husai, may Allah bless them for the, the difficulty of experiencing the reality of social media. It's a beast and there's so much hate and there's so much frustration. The amount of nights I've waken up with anxiety in the middle of the night because my face is online is just so much. But what I've seen is the messages from sisters, especially younger sisters and older sisters, it's just been so worth it. And so why I'm telling you all of that is because if you feel like what you want to do is give a particular message and in a field that really needs to be represented, especially from women, especially su su um, supporting other women, I think it's such a critical, critical um, role that no someone needs to take. What I would recommend is number one, make istikhara. I personally make istikhara before basically any post. I make istikhara multiple times before doing things and I ask for advice. I send what I'm about to post to other people, getting their feedback before I do. I think that that shura is really important. And, you know, the intention thing. People ask me this, they're like, how can you maintain a sincere intention with like the more and more people that might see, the more and more people that, you know, it's about followers, it's about likes, it's all those things. And like, really, I think the best advice that I can give you is be an extremely insecure person because nothing will impact, you will never be good enough. And so that's my advice, just be really insecure and make a sahara. <laughs> I like that only the people here are laughing because they know my insecurities. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, at the end of the day, you always think like, this is not coming with me to the grave except to be a punishment unless you do it for the sake of Allah. And if you're not doing it for the sake of Allah, if not, what, what does it matter how many followers you have? First of all, Facebook was a big thing. Barely anyone uses it now. No respect. I mean, all respect to the people who actually do. And now, okay, so then all those people who had all those big followings, now what? Now TikTok is the thing. And 10 years, what it's, what's this kind of, no one's going to remember who we are. This life, this life, probably most of our names are not going to be remembered, except for, inshallah, all the sisters, of everyone in this room, and everyone we love, I mean. But the point is that, I just really have a time for 20 minutes. Oh my gosh, the point, make your make dua, ask a lot of people. May Allah make you sincere and always ask Allah to purify your intentions, to be sincere and think about what you're doing before you do it. Make multiple intentions before you press post because really it doesn't benefit you in the long run for any other reason other than you're doing it for the sake of Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all sincere. I mean, also PS, please download Qari'a, the Women Quran Reciters app. Um, since we're talking about social media, it's on app stores, both of them, Q-A-R-I-A-H, it's free, it's for women, Qariya, the Women Quran Reciters app. I've met so many of you who are like, I love the work you're doing, I'm like, have you downloaded the Qariya? They're like, no. I'm like, why? It's free. So, sorry. All right. Can I just, just to add one thing. Yes. Zakilah khair, ya Maryam. This was a, the, one of the best advice I was given 20 years ago. Don't learn to teach. And don't learn to be famous. Don't go on social media if you want to. Don't. Go against your nerves. Because you're going to be drained. You're going to be following. You know how many people, they like me, they don't like me, and the followers. Don't. Wait. If Allah wants to use you through social media, He'll use you. What I just shared with you. The TikTok that now I am on, Allah knows how many people for years they were after me. And I was absolutely against it. You know how Allah made me do it? You've talked to me, but I wasn't convinced. At 16, you know, you know why? Because you always wait till Allah shows you. This is very important. 16-year-old boy, his mother sent me my clip. She said, someone put it on TikTok. And I said, really? It was not us, someone. And, I said, and she said, please put yours on TikTok. I said, why? She said, my son really loves it. Khalas. Done. Did you see my point? So for the sister who asked, Allah gave you the knowledge, but he didn't tell you to teach. And he didn't tell you to go on social media yet. He taught you, wait, ask him to show you. Because that's a dangerous trap. Social media, being popular, being famous, don't you think it's easy to be in these shoes? 
You know what I'm talking about. So wait, if Allah wants to use, استعملني ولا تستبدلني. Ya Allah, use me and don't replace me. And he will use you the way he thinks is the best for you. I'm sorry I took it, but I just wanted to make this point. It's okay. The next question is actually for you, Dr. Haifa. Uh, what, to do if, what to do if two people are strongly convinced that they are being wronged by the other person? Both are taking guidance from the Quran and Sunnah, but are looking at things from a completely different, opposite lens. I'll remind you of hadith of Rasulullah I think he said the meaning of whomsoever leave an argument and you know you are right but you leave it look at your place in Jannah that's the answer period because if you were right and you did it, you're placed in Jannah. And if you were wrong and you live it and you left it, Alhamdulillah. Period. Don't, uh, this also goes to Tuskia and to your nafs. Don't defend your nafs. I have to show her I'm right. That's your nafs talking. Leave it. Leave it for Allah. And He will absolutely defend you and show you. Bi'idhnillah. Jazakallah khair, Ustada Hussai, the mic. Uh, regarding privacy within the marriage, you talked about uh, transparency. What are the limits? What if others, like the in-laws, ask their spouse not to share a halal but private conversation? Uh, I saw that question. I was a little confused by the context. Um, the in-laws are speaking to whom? And I, I, it was a bit confusing for me. But in general, I would say that as I mentioned during the talk, you know, there are certain um, things that are sacred in the, in, in the marital relationship and the bond that we have with our spouses is really important to maintain. As we know, Iblis seeks to destroy the, the family because if he destroys the husband and the wife, he destroys the family, he destroys the community, he has this ripple effect. So we have to be on guard and know his tactics. And having secrecy and these duplicitous natures where I have my life and you have your life and we don't ever really have transparency, I think is a very dangerous game to play. And it comes from a lot of these modern ideas about you know women and men having to always have everything as mashallah dr haifa beautifully alluded to it's always these po political ideas that come into our marriages we have to use hikmah we have to use wisdom and i think just having some some uh, basic you know uh, understandings between you and every couple is going to have to decide what that means for my for example my marriage my husband, any day, any time of the day, it doesn't matter if it's in the middle of the night, in the morning, if he wants to see my phone, marhaba, here you go. There's no, oh no, you can't look at my stuff, it's private, he doesn't have access to my passcode. I just don't believe that that's healthy, so he can get into my phone and I can go into his phone. I have all his access to his emails, he can go into my email, he can do whatever he wants. But he knows respectfully, there are certain things that are very private, and I tell him because I have sisters that message me that for that reason, please do not touch these things because it's confidence that I have of other women or other people. But everything else between him and I, there is this understanding that there's no privacy. So I think, you know, really having a culture of mutual respect, of um, honoring one another's preferences. Some people might have more, you know, things that they are, that they want just from experiences you know I, I know people who've come out of really unhealthy relationships so they may they, they might need a, a little bit more you know in their current relationship because of their past so just being compassionate and seeing people where they are and having open dialogue I think will remove a lot of the doubt and suspicion and all of those things of shaitan and um, you know that he wants to you know create between the couple so just have open communication that's that as far as in-laws and other people I mean again we have to be very clear about boundaries um, within our, our marriages and that goes for for anybody that's not involved in the marriage you can always seek advice but to have people meddling in your marriage um, I think is also a very dangerous uh, thing so we should you know be very clear that we will, as a couple, for example, if we have um, problems, that we have one person, or, or at least there's a due process of how we're going to, you know, mediate our problems. But it's not this kind of, 
you know, open, um, haphazard way of, of, uh, of letting anybody into the marriage. Because there's things that are very private. And once you lose trust, again, this is how shaitan uh, sows those seeds of discord. So these agreements, a lot of the stuff can be taken care of with premarital counseling. So please, if you're not married, go into premarital counseling because experts like mashallah, Dr. Rania and others who are in the field of either mental health or do this as a professional, um, this is part of their expertise. They will guide you on how to have these contracts that are mutually beneficial. That is the key. It has to be mutually beneficial. That's very different than equal, okay? And those words, I know, are interchanged, but mutually beneficial is rooted in respect. It's rooted in, in again, taqwa, in, 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 in uh, inshallah, in the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala above the nafs. And if we, I think, conduct ourselves in that respectful way, we will have agreements um, with our spouses that uh, will not leave anyone feeling that they, you know, have a need to hide or have a need to, to, uh, to do things any other way. So I hope that was clear. Uh, uh, we got a question. Um, somebody wants to take their shahada, and we don't know if it's in person Allahu or online. Allahu so, Akbar. Because. Oh, Allahu yay. Akbar. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Already. Can you tell us about yourself? I just received the question right now, so that's why. Um, so, I have some friends in the community. I live in Pacifica, Madison. Nice to meet you all. Um, thank you. Um, I actually come from an atheist family, um, and I've done some research here and there about all the religions, and just so happens that this is the one that sat in my heart. Um, I had some trouble kind of connecting my head and my heart because there's some things I'm trying to learn about logic, and but I feel it in my heart, and I'm ready to say the shahada. <laughs> Yeah. So, Madison, just let me give you a little bit of, uh, so you're coming to a religion which is the essence of it is the base of every religion. It's only one God, you worship and you submit. That's basically it. And all the other religions, the base is the same, but then things change. And that's probably why your heart felt there. And that's the usual story, because anything else I wouldn't say it doesn't make sense, but doesn't make a pure sense. Can't be more than one. This is too perfect. This is too sophisticated to have too many people. You know what I'm saying? So it is one. So this is basically what Islam is submission to the will of God. That's what we were all talking about. And basically what I'm going to... Um, you're going to say after me, I'm going to say it in Arabic, then just say it, and then I'll say it in English. I I'm going to say it very, very slowly. <laughs> I'm like driving in the car. Oh, so you're practicing. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a disclaimer. Honestly, we had no idea. I just read the question. I, if you saw me, I was, I leaned. Exactly. And I leaned uh, to uh, Stada Fadwa. I was like, oh, and who is she? We don't know. Alhamdulillah. So basically, the declaration of shahada, or the declaration, the door to get to Islam is that you declare two things. That Allah, God, is one, and Rasul, the messenger, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his messenger. That's basically it. So, bismillah. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. An. An. La. La. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illa. Illa. Illa Allah. Illa Allah. Wa ashhadu. Wa ashhadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. I bear witness. I bear witness. There is no deity. There is no deity. Other than Allah. Other than Allah. I bear witness. I bear witness. That there is Muhammad. That Muhammad. His messenger. His messenger. And the last messenger. And the last messenger. Allahu Akbar. Allah. Welcome to us. May Allah keep us strong, Ya Rabbi Amin. And you're in a beautiful community. May Allah keep her strong, everyone. She's in an amazing community. Make a dua for us. I'm jealous because you're pure. And I mean it. The person who enters Islam, everything else is white. So I have a lot of things to, to clear. Everybody. She is pure whiteboard. So welcome, my dear. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you a key that you guide other people. Ya Rabbi Amin. Now you can hug. Group hug, group hug, group hug. Can I give her a kiss? No, yes, group hug. Yes, oh, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Yes. On behalf of the Rahma Foundation, especially the MCC, we wanted to give you this gift box called Being Muslim. Inside you'll find a Quran, 
and a prayer rug and some other books to kind of begin the journey and some other goodies and things. But we are here in person. So this is for you, Madison. This wasn't planned. This, this wasn't planned at all. I swear, they just brought this out of nowhere. <laughs> out of nowhere. I'm saying that. I'm saying that. Well, yeah, MCC, mashallah, may Allah bless this masjid and the convert committee that's yes. here. There's some wonderful programming here, and we hope you'll join us. You were connected, right? My, yeah, of course, but it's my first time. I just, I just, <laughs> I just found you on YouTube. I'm serious. I just found you on YouTube. Are you serious? I'm serious. She's saying, really? She's saying she just found us on YouTube a week ago. Allah Akbar. Allah guides whom he wills. Mashallah. <laughs> Congratulations. We're here for you too. MCC, yes. Give Madison a huddle. Give Madison a huddle. It's the most COVID friendly thing I've ever done. Madison the Muslima. The superhero. MashaAllah. You know, I want to say one thing. Whenever you do a good deed, the sign that the good deed is accepted when Allah follows with another good deed. So look at this. Subhanallah. You came, you support, may Allah reward all the organizers. And this is the second time, actually. Yeah. This is the third conference. This is the second time. Last time, the same thing happened. And that lady was actually not in the conference. She texts and says, wait for me. Remember? Yes. And we waited for her. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. May Allah accept from all of us. May Allah make us an example to the people outside, that they see us and they want to enter Islam, Ya Rabbi. All right, back to the questions. Just real quick, Sadah Hussain, who was the one who slapped Amina radiallahu anha? Abu Jahl. For those of you taking notes, all right, Sadah Hussain again. So what author's books did you utilize for your talk and would you recommend to learn from? I can't remember. Um, I have some children's books on like Sahaba and Sahabiyat and then online sources. There's mashallah a lot of hadith um, websites, a lot of the contents available on hadith and there's also great talks. I listened to one by, um, which is a really great talk, Dr. Omar Suleiman, mashallah he did. He has a series so I would definitely recommend listening to that one. I, is it the first? I don't know the if first. that's the title of it. I'm sorry. Yeah, the but first. Yeah, he, he did it on different, uh, like, Sahaba and Sahabiyat, yes. so, mashallah. mashallah, very rich uh, information, yeah. Uh, Dr. Rania, as we know about the roles of women outside of motherhood, but for me it's been challenging to learn about Sahabia during their pregnancies and, and challenges other than the story of Asma and Maryam. It is a blessing, but uh, there are mental, physical challenges in which our culture would minimize them. Are there any resources for that? Also, does Medistan offer therapy or care for postpartum depression? Absolutely. Absolutely. I could probably talk about postpartum depression forever, subhanAllah, and how much our cultures and ourselves, particularly even as women, but I'll also say all people, including doctors. I can't tell you how many doctors don't believe in postpartum depression. It's the strangest, weirdest thing. I'm like, how did you graduate from medical school and you don't know that postpartum depression is real? Sometimes it's their own wives as physicians that I'm, they're saying, eh, get over it. What do you mean get over it? Have you not studied that particularly, I'm going to go into a whole spiel now, forgive me, but <laughs> certain mental health conditions are biologically connected. Postpartum depression is absolutely one of those because it is hormonally based more often than not. Other types of sometimes in the postpartum depression itself or other forms of depression and anxiety could also have environmental causes. So if you're living in some really difficult circumstances, think about all kinds of things that kind of really cause you anxiety and difficulty could also cause you postpartum depression after the birth of the child. Or now we mostly could call it peripartum depression, even within the pregnancy and after it. Or if it's not biological and it's not genetic and it's not environmental, it could be actually cognitive, it could be spiritual, it could be many different things actually. But to me, it's so amazing that we get so stuck on these things can't possibly be true when in reality, the very same hormones that allow that baby to be in the mother's womb and carried for all those months is also are the same hormones implicated in postpartum depression. If you believe pregnancy can happen, then you believe postpartum depression can happen too. Plummeting of those hormones causes some women to experience postpartum depression. 
We had, I don't know how many, how many did we have in the room? Over 300, yeah? The stats are one in four women experience postpartum depression. Now count off, one, two, three, four, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there are so many women in this room alone, plus all of our sisters online, we see you in here and we love you, mashallah, who also have experienced postpartum depression in their life. So when women negate that, I'm like, hold on. <laughs> you know your own sisters and yourselves. This is very common. The quicker that we can actually get over this issue and be there as a support for each other, the better we're all going to be for it. The better that we say to our own daughters and our own sisters, snap out of it, or shame on you, Allah gave you a kid, how dare you be upset? A'udhu billah. These are real things that happen. And so, in short, yes, Maristan, alhamdulillah, is our local Islamic nonprofit that dedicate, it's dedicated to mental health and actually integrating Islam into the therapy. It offers all kinds of therapy and support, alhamdulillah, professional by those who are trained professional therapists. The booth is at the back. I think Sister Tismita is here somebody, somewhere and can answer your questions, inshallah. But also, please know that it's also virtual. So again, for the state of California, anybody in the state of California can access that care. And also, please know that we also make sure that it's financially available. MCC has been a wonderful partner. We're able to have financial support for those who can't afford the therapy. And I encourage everybody to get that support, even if it's not postpartum depression, even if it's family counseling for your own kids, if it's academic support that people are struggling with, test taking anxiety, let's say, or whatever kinds of difficulties, please get the help, folks. Now back to the sister who's asking, what can I do about the stories related to pregnancy that seems that I was very clear about the story that I told about Sayyidina Amina, the mother of the Prophet وسلم, what she experienced was a miracle. Are we clear about that? The Prophet وسلم, is entirely a miracle. And so clearly his pregnancy was going to be a miracle too. The fact that she didn't feel the heaviness that a woman feels when carrying a child or the difficulty that comes with it, or the very mere fact that when he was born, he didn't have any of the filth, you know, the, the stuff, the fluids that are on a baby. He didn't even have that when he was born. The whole thing, sallallahu alayhi wa the whole story is a miracle. So clearly that's different than any one of us, right? And yeah, pregnancy's tough, <laughs> mashallah. And I too wish that our cultures and our communities would stop minimizing the difficulty that actually comes with it. And also the struggles and pains of infertility. There are struggles and pains all throughout, whether having children or not having them. And so what do we do? We support each other. And we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually allows for us to understand the wisdom behind either the challenges or the ease that Allah gives us that every one of those pregnancies is different or the lack of them is something also challenges and difficulties that Allah has given us to help us through into that next stage but a lot of that comes with wisdom and I hope you'll find the people along your path inshallah that'll help you understand those wisdom inshallah you mentioned that Sumayya radiallahu anha made a sacrifice, giving away something that is valuable for something that you recognize is clearly more valuable. But how do we reach the state where we can achieve those sacrifices in our daily lives, if necessary for us when pertaining to our deen, especially when it seems so hard at times? Is there anything that we can do to achieve that level of taqwa? Jazakallah khair, I really loved your talk. Jazakallah khair, and inshallah, when I reach that level of taqwa, I'll share my tips with you. Um, we're all struggling, right? We're all on a journey. Uh, nobody is perfect. Nobody has got it all figured out. Uh, so when we're talking about trying to reach a particular stage of taqwa, I don't think any of us has like, okay, next Thursday I'm going to be done, inshallah. I'll be, you know, like I've reached that stage, right? Um, so what do we do when we are faced with some sort of struggle or sacrifice? Um, I think the, the biggest thing that I would suggest, obviously after dua and turning to Allah and making sincere dua to Allah, is also make sure you have a support system. A lot of people go through these things alone. Um, they feel maybe embarrassed that, uh, maybe they feel like the thing that I'm going through is trivial, so they trivialize it and they feel embarrassed because they think other people are going through worse, what do I have to complain about? Uh, and so they, they don't seek support, or they feel like nobody in the world could possibly understand what I'm going through, I've got it so terribly, um, that they just feel like they feel hopeless, right? 
And we don't want to be on either extremes, and we ask Allah SWT to protect us. Always seek support. Um, you look at the lives of the prophets, alayhi salatu wassalam, they sought support, right? Um, we look at Musa alayhi salam, right? When Allah tasks him with going to Fir'aun, he has this entire conversation with Allah, right? Allah shows him these miracles, um, he's speaking directly with Allah, right? Then Allah shows him these amazing miracles, and then Allah tells him, go to Fir'aun, and Musa alayhi salam says, okay, let's go. No, he makes dua, right? First he makes dua, and then after he makes dua, what does he say? Okay, I'm going alone. No, he says, let my brother come with me, right? And Allah SWT accepts his dua. Allah doesn't say, didn't I just say I'm with you? Why are you asking? No, right? So it's okay to seek support. The Prophet SAW sought support, right? What is, we know that the Prophet SAW made dua that, Ya Allah, allow one of the two Umars to accept Islam. And Umar ibn al-Khattab was the one that Allah SWT chose to bless with uh, guidance, right? The Prophet SAW sought support. Um, so that's the first thing that I would suggest, and really the main thing I would suggest is seek support. I can guarantee that a lot of the sacrifices and the difficulties that we go through, somebody has probably gone through something similar, um, if not the exact same thing, right? Uh, so talk to your sisters in the community, get to know your sisters, reach out to professionals if you need to, but don't go it alone. Okay, keep your du'as with Allah, keep Allah close to you, ask Allah for help, but also seek support from your community, from the sisters who love you. And I pray that Allah SWT makes it easy for us all to reach a level of taqwa that he's pleased with. Um, yes, yes, please, go ahead. Sure. Just quickly, Jazakiyah al khairin. Excellent advice, and I just wanted to echo everything you just said as far as support systems. Alhamdulillah, we are so blessed in this community to have Mashallah, Dr. Rania and Maristan and the, this organization that provides professional services. But here at MCC too, we're also headed in that direction of trying to really create support systems that are, uh, you know, more uh, just for, for those who don't really, are not ready maybe perhaps to, to seek out, or maybe they are and they're doing it, um, you know, uh, in conjunction with, but they want actual sahbah. So we just recently, with, it's been a couple of months, but here the last Saturday of every month at MCC from 9 to 11 a.m. in that room, myself and a few other sisters in this community come together, we read Quran, we do dhikr, we do salawat, and then at the end we do something that is exactly everything that Ustadha Fusina was talking about, which is seeking support, but in a very uh, non-intrusive uh, way, it's just a, it's a, whatever, whoever wants to share, um, and it's really just healing and, and uh, holding space with one another, listening to one another, and alhamdulillah, I've been doing this for a, a pretty long time, and I feel like every single time we do those dua circles where everybody kind of just shares whatever's burdening them, I always get a lot of feedback that I really needed this today. I needed to feel held by my sisters, heard and then i feel like most of us alhamdulillah allah you know has i think women generally we tend to know the solutions to our problems right which is why one of the biggest complaints women have of their spouses is they're always trying to solve their problems and you're like i don't want you to solve my problem i just want you to listen to me complain about my problems uh, and I think validation and really just having a comforting voice. I mean, just even being up on this panel, I feel so reassured when I can see, like, mashallah, she's been awesome, nodding her head, letting me know, yes, what you're saying is resonating. And, or, you know, all of my co-panelists, it's very comforting to the human heart, right, to be seen and to be heard. And we're missing that. That's the bottom line. We are so disconnected as a community. And the problem is, is we come into a lot of these spaces because of the pressures of what being perfect at everything, being the superwoman, I have to have it handled, that we are leading with, a, with the facade and the persona that we want people to think of us and to find spaces where we can just be real and raw without judgment. And you, you, you share at your own discretion. So there's no expectation to share, but there's permission to share. So I invite all of you, if you would like, it's open. There's no commitment required. But I, we created this program specifically for this, to create places of sahba. So may Allah give us all you know, support and let us all come together, inshallah. This is beautiful, sisterhood. And that's why we love 
Rahma Foundation, and we love Jannah Institute, and we love all of our female-led organizations because this is what they're doing. Alhamdulillah. Just and we love the Qari app. Yes. And the <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you. Estada Mariam is next. A couple of questions regarding um, can women follow the janazah and watch the burial of their loved ones, and can pregnant women go to the cemetery, and also um, uh, going for Hajj or Umrah, Wild any fast or hide. What what are some resources about figuring out how to do that? Um, and I know you you have a book coming out in six months, inshallah. Inshallah. Um, so with regards to just because we're we I don't we're not giving a whole class. I won't give you all the different opinions and the reasonings why. I'll just give you the base answer. Yes, it is permissible to follow the janazah and to attend the burial pregnancy. Mensis, none of those have a, a weight on whether or not you do that. Um, that includes washing the body. You don't need to not be on your period to be, uh, do so. However, let me just say you are going to see a difference of opinion sometimes from scholars. And I'm not going into all the details of that right now, just because of this this the reality. But the point is that there are going to be some of the same exact texts are understood differently by different scholars and different madahib. So yes, there are going to be scholars who say that it is impermissible. And then there are other scholars who refute that and they provide their proofs on why it is permissible, amongst which the Prophet them passed a woman who was um, upset emotionally at the grave of her son. And she didn't realize it was the Prophet them, and he reminded her to be patient and she spoke um, uh, disrespectfully, um, just in the moment of her grief, and the Prophet ﷺ didn't tell her, you're, you're not allowed to be here. Um, he's a legislator of law. He it is an, an incumbent upon him to make that clarification, sallallahu alayhi wa If someone is in the middle of doing something that's not that's not correct and he sees it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, Aisha radiallahu anha, she went and visited the grave of her brother, um, radiallahu anhu, and then a companion saw her and asked about specifically, aren't women not supposed to be going? And I'm just super summarizing this. Um, but she responded, she asked the Prophet ﷺ in another narration, what should she say when she goes to visit the grave? The Prophet ﷺ taught her what to say. So these are all evidences on women going, visiting the grave. There are a number of them from the Sahabiyat um, that exist, and that came after the initial prohibition and then the order to go, with the, uh, the recommendation to go. Other scholars who would disagree with this are going to look at those later narrations and give reasonings. Aisha radiallahu anha only visited her brother because he couldn't, she couldn't attend the janazah, for example. They're going to give their reasonings on why, no, actually, this is not meant for all women. This is a specific circumstance. Do you see where I'm coming with, like, how the, the, the scholars look at it differently? Sorry, I can't go into it more here, but the point is um, there is ample evidence to allow for it uh, to be done. With regards to the um, Mensis question, Yes, so to go into Hajj or Umrah, you don't, um, the only part you absolutely need to be in will do in. You can get into your ihram on your period. You can do the other rites on your period, but you cannot make tawaf. However, if you're in Hajj or Umrah and you're only going to be there a few days and you don't live, you know, an hour or two hours away that you can just, you know, be in ihram for a certain amount of, or excuse me, never mind, I won't say that part. Ignore what I just said. The point is, not everyone's group can just stay longer until a woman's period is done. That's just not realistic today. And so if you are not able to make Umrah without being pure from your period, then Ibn Taymiyyah and a number of other scholars mention that yes, you can make the tawaf on your period because you don't have another choice. There's a discussion on whether or not a woman needs to give a sacrifice for that. Ibn Taymiyyah's opinion is not, but there's other discussions on um, whether or not it should be done. So if you are going to go for Hajar Umrah, I would recommend reaching out to your Hajj or Umrah group, although now you can go on your own, so maybe that doesn't exist. I can't tell you a, um, a source that I know of in English. If you, anyone knows, please share it. That's why part of the book that, alhamdulillah, I finished writing the manuscript on has a whole section on this, just because I couldn't find it in English. Inshallah, I pray it'll be beneficial in a year, inshallah. Um, but if anyone has resources, please share. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah khair. Make dua that the book comes out and it's pleasing to Allah. A couple of couple of points for the ladies. When there is a different opinion, what you need to do is you need to respect both. It doesn't matter which one you follow. And I say this to myself, number one, who, are, who I am to argue. Following, there is two things about janazah. There's following the janazah, and then being in the graveyard side during the barrier. And then there is visiting the graveyard afterwards. There's three things you have to separate. Now, it all depends upon the scholars who tells you you, you are allowed to, what you are going to be doing there. 
I don't know if you have been there, I have been there. It's one of the hardest things you will see, is when you put your loved one in a grave. If you don't think you can obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that moment, then don't go. If you can, and it's a reminder, this is actually why he allowed it later on, Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam. He said it, كُنْتُ نَهِيتُكُمْ عَنْ زِيَرَةِ الْقُبُورِ فَزُورُوهَا فَنَّا تُذَكِرُكُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِ I prevented you from visiting the graveyard. Now go, because it reminds you of the Akhirah. So if the woman is going to go composed, dressed, pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I attended one. And I said to myself, now I know why some scholar says don't go. And I am a woman. So if you are going to go, pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, dress code, actions, what are you doing? Then yes, you can follow that opinion. If you cannot obey Allah in whatever the way it is, then don't go. Because you are starting something, others may follow you, and then you need to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you need to know there's two opinions, both are valid. As uh, Ustad Maryam said, the discussion is, is this is valid, this is valid. But you, as a person, when you are there, what are you going to be doing? I, I attended one young woman. They were putting her in the grave, and people were doing selfie. I attended. It's not I heard. I did see it. And then I said, now I know when some scholar says don't do it. Uh, Dr. Amina, can you share a bit about how women who converted in secret, even hiding their faith from their husbands, manifested their day-to-day -day practice of Islam? So how do they take care of their obligations? Do we know? So, subhanAllah, at the time of Umm al-Fadl, actually a lot of the, the pillars of Islam that we have now were mandated in the second year of Hijrah. So she had been Muslim for a long time. And what we don't, like, again, subhanAllah, I think we all kind of talked about this. The first 13 years in Mecca was, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who are you? Like, when you look at the Meccan Qur'an, which is the overwhelming majority of the Qur'an, it's about good character and it's about good ethics. And the re reason I think this is so important is, like, there's the hadith of the Prophet where he says, أَثَذْرُونَ مِنْ muflis." Do you know who's broke? And they said, Ya Rasulullah, the one that doesn't, لا درهم له ولا دينار, doesn't have any dollars or cents. <laughs> And he said, no, he's a person that prays and fasted and then comes the day of judgment, they insulted so-and-so and they did, they hit so-and-so, they did. Like, subhanAllah, you lose all of your good deeds that way. So part of, first and foremost, grounding ourselves in ethics, subhanAllah, at the time, they didn't, the, the salat, they used to pray once in the morning and once in the evening, and it was only two rak'ahs. And they would only, the fasting that they would do, because like, if you're trying to hide your iman, those are the two major things. You would, and they had to fast the day of Arafah. The Ramadan was not mandatory yet. I've had a lot of friends that would tell me stories of praying in the closet. And I know other people of like, oh, you can't pray in the bathroom. That was the only place that it was private enough for them to be able to pray. They just close the toilet seat. Like if you can, if you can worship freely, thank Allah for that. Because you don't realize how incredible an opportunity that is, subhanAllah. If someone can, like, may Allah protect us, if someone leaves Islam, or someone actually becomes Muslim, they usually do it during their college years. And there's so many people I talk to, they're like, we can't tell our parents. We, we won't be able to go to, co can't go to college anymore. So there's a, a lot of very real implications in people's lives. And especially, like, subhanAllah, you don't know, if you don't know how your family is going to react, you try it a bit by bit. And you take your time with it, and you seek counsel, and you do your best. SubhanAllah. I mean, I, especially like there's, I mean, right now the stakes are, do I get to graduate from college or not? Do I have financial support or not? There are people, may Allah protect us, is literally your life is on the line if you become Muslim. May Allah protect us from that. Can I add something about the Hajj? No one has their period for the two, whole two weeks of Hajj. Like fiqhan, you, that it, you can't. And unfortunately, the most popular opinion out there is like, just take the pills. For you to take the pills where it regulates your period enough, you have to take them for three months, which means that before Ramadan, you started taking them. The overwhelming majority of women don't do that. And if you go and you miss one, and then you start spotting, and then people get confused, and now they're frustrated, and they're like, am I not praying? Am I not praying? Like, it just, it, it frustrates me because the way it's told is like, oh, just go take care of that. Go be less woman at Hajj. You don't have to be any less woman at Hajj. Like, it just, it's so, like, alhamdulillah, thank you.
I went when I went like I was I was in a really large group and I'm telling the the male scholars I'm like oh so the women that are still on their periods just send them to me because I was also still just on, I was still on my period I was waiting till I was done and then I took the group we did our umrah and then if you get like there's more Maryam and I are working on scenarios hopefully if we can have it published before next Hajj that would be great inshallah but really alhamdulillah like there's there's ways to talk about it. And there's ways to figure it out. And if in the extreme case that you got your period, the morning of Eid, and you just missed the time of when the tawaf became mandatory, and you can't, you're not going to finish before you leave because you're bleeding more than seven days, then, okay, now then you can take the exception. But for the overwhelming majority, it's like a statistical anomaly that that would actually happen. Not, not to get too nerdy, but anyways. <laughs> All right. So Dr. Uh, Haifa, um, can I call the adhan in my home when no one else is home? Maybe the medium would love to demonstrate an adhan for us. Uh, can I call the adhan in my home when my teenage son is home but doesn't want to do it? Why do you want to do it? You always have to ask yourself, why do you want to invent the wheel? And you know Sahabi at the time of Rasulullah Sam had a beautiful voice. And say that Aisha couldn't stand up and do her adhan. Why do you want to do it? I think this is something we women really need to. So one of the speakers said, don't fall in that trap. If they didn't do it, don't do it. You know what I would worry about? Worry about your quality of salah. Worry about your khushu'ah. Worry about what you are reading in the salah. Why do you want to do the adhan? And if your son doesn't want to do it, guess what? How many apps that uh, do the adhan these days? I attended recently a home, the whole house had the adhan. Honestly, and I was like, where is this coming from? And they just showed me the phone. And that was connected to all their speakers. Don't waste your energy, my beautiful sisters, in things that may not get me to Jannah. And I said may not. Focus on things for sure guaranteed. I don't have a lot of life to live, or thousands of hours. There's different opinion about it. In general, the woman is not supposed to call for a dan. So why do I want to do that? Period. Yeah, and you want to practice your voice? Memorize the Quran. Uh, 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 a lot of times in conferences and lectures we get the push to make a change in the Ummah and make a difference. I really admire all the people starting institutions and leading organizations, but I feel s spread thin just from focusing on raising a righteous family, being a good wife, dealing with family issues, and keeping up with my own dean. How can I do it all like you all? <laughs> uh, Dr. Rodney is going to answer this. <laughs> We could tell the we could tell the Dr. Rania we could tell the story of uh, Dr. Rania tell the story of uh, early first women's dean intensive. So we we wanted we want I'll tell, I'll start the story but then she can talk about how she juggles and uh, a lot of it has to do with support. Uh, but we I mean you guys see the the pretty side of of us coming to the conference like we had to plan dinner. You know, our spouses, alhamdulillah, are, are, are supportive in that, um, you know, they're taking on responsibilities that we would otherwise do. Uh, we don't say they're babysitting because we are both parents to our children. All of the things that you had to do, and I talked about this like, starting at 2 o'clock, we gave sisters a chance to, like, make a good breakfast or brunch, you know, finish your laundry, do the grocery shopping, and then come rest at MCC while you listen to your... Uh, program, we, the same thing happens on the other side of the stage. Sisters had to travel, you know, uh, uh, make plans, come from different areas. So all of the logistical things, but I think for a lot of our teachers, the, the intention, uh, wanting to do and serve the community, uh, putting whatever Allah facilitates for us is what we do. Um, you know, we can't always be at every program, at every talk, fill every request, but just trying to be open to everything that we can do. And I know a lot of amazing sisters who are doing work in the community that nobody knows about, whether it's feeding people, providing them groceries, watching children, you know, um, 
So it's just to facilitate somebody else being able to do what they want. It's happening everywhere. A lot of the silent soldiers that nobody hears about, you know, all of that is happening. So don't minimize what you are doing as long as you're doing something. And you have to ask yourself, what is, like Dr. Haifa says, you know, not what I want to do, but what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opening up for me to do? What is that path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made easy for me? And do that. And just go with it. Uh, because there's a lot of things that you may think are better than other things, but you don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how he's created your path to Jannah. And so just walk whatever path Allah opens for you. And inshallah, it will get you to where we all want to be, which is inshallah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, chilling in the Jannah, drinking milk and eating honey. And inshallah, that's what we want. We want to be together. Anyhow, uh, Dr. Rania. No, no, that was perfect. <laughs> Wasn't I mean, it? Yeah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Uh, Astad of Sina. How do you suggest finding balance between sacrificing time in this dunya and making time to build your akhirah? Uh, balancing the career and seeking knowledge. Oh, that's an interesting one. So, how much time do we have? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we actually we don't we only have seven minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a three minute answer, inshallah, or try. Here's the thing, right? Um it's a very broad question because there is this idea that they're kind of mutually exclusive. Um there's also this idea, a lot of the times I think when we see speakers on the stage and we hear so much about what they've done, we don't realize that this is years, years of work, right? Um uh, the other thing is everybody's situation is different, right? Um, so what one person is able to do with the resources Allah has blessed them with, another person may not be able to do. They've got other talents that Allah Santa has given them. Um, also, even as an individual, right? I'm going to ask you all a question. Raise your hand if your entire life has always been the same. Nothing's ever, ever changed in your life. Nothing. It's been just permanently the same. All right, most people are not like that, right? Um, you're, you might be single, then you're married. You might have kids. You might be working, then you're staying at home, right? People's situations change. And so we have to allow our uh, actions to kind of mold and to, to kind of go with the flow, if you will, right? Um, I'll give you a personal example. Uh, for example, when I started the Qalam Seminary in 2015, it was a one-year program. They're, they have a five-year Alamiya program now. They don't have it anymore, or they, they didn't have it at the time. Um, so I did, the, I did a year of Arabic. Then I did a year of seminary. These were all full-time. I wasn't working, right? Then I realized I have to pay bills, so I should probably get myself a job and get back to work. Um, then Qalam started their five-year Alamiya program. I was like, this is amazing. I'd really like to be able to do this. But honestly, I can't afford to take five years off of work and study full-time. I just can't. It's not something I can afford to do. Um, so what I did is I joined uh, different institutions that do part-time classes that I can do online. That's around the time when I did my hivs, I did my ijazat and the qiraat, um, and so forth, right? So. You have to allow yourself to find a way based on your situation. You have to be practical, right? You're, you're not going to race around. Like I, I, did a, I did a master's degree in Islamic studies during COVID, and the only reason I was able to do it is because of COVID, um, where the university is in London, and they decided to offer their classes online because of COVID. I, it's been my dream to go to this university and study there. I was like, I can't afford to quit my job and move to London. And then Allah SWT <laughs> made it easy for me. And, Oh, from um, University of London, they have a um, uh, department called SOAS. Um, so I did my master's degree from there. But it was easy because I, all I had to do was 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., I would take a class. And then I'd get, get to work. And I did that for a year, right? Um, so Allah SWT will open doors for you. Your job is to never lose touch. Do whatever you can that's practical, that fits your schedule, right? Don't, don't say, okay, I have to memorize Quran in six months, I have to master the Arabic language in three months, I have to 
quit my job and leave my family and move abroad. Or what works for one person doesn't work for the other person. What works for you won't work for other people and so forth, right? So I think that's what it is, is you have to prioritize, you have to be balanced, but don't lose touch, right? Um, we have so many uh, organizations and such now, alhamdulillah, that offer different courses and stuff. You'll find something that works for you. Make dua to Allah that Allah SWT will make it easy. Um, and you will find things that you can do, bi-ithnillahi ta'ala. Also, keep knocking at the door. Sometimes, like, if you want to study, uh, the door doesn't open. Um, and then you get frustrated. I remember uh, I was uh, taking Malki Fik with Sheikh Hamza, and it was like, Tahara prayer, Tahara prayer, Tahara prayer. I think I took the same book, like, four or five times. Because it was the only one that was being offered at the time in the area, and I wasn't able to go abroad to study. And I, so I, I, I went, I did the worst thing ever. I went to Sheikh Hamza and complained. And I said, Sheikh Hamza, I, you know... It's kind of like I'm doing the same book over and over again, and I feel like, you know, I wish I could go. I was complaining because I couldn't go anywhere to study, and he said, you know, there are people who want to study, and there are people who want to want to study. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he said, check your intention. Maybe you want to want to study, which means like you want to be part of that group that wants to study, but you don't actually firmly have an intention to study. And then uh, I was like, okay. And then we got a resident scholar from the country I wanted to study in. And then we got another one. And then we got another one. And so alhamdulillah, he brought that to my attention and uh, set me straight. Uh, this one's for you, Dr. Rania, so you can have the mic. Uh, you mentioned blended families. Do stepchildren become mahram? Uh, do you need to wear a veil around stepchildren or adopted children? Do husbands, siblings, parents, and children become your mahram? So all the fifth questions, mashallah. Well, kind of, I'm going to take the approach that Ustada Maryam took and say that there actually are some differing opinions related to the nuance questions, because these are multiple. I don't even think I caught them all right there. But all the different questions. I think I want to go back to the more important piece of this and then tell you references and resources where you can learn more about the specific case. The reason for that is it has a lot to do with the ages of when these children come into the family. It has to do with whether they were nursed or not. There's so many different pieces to this particular uh, question. And so it's probably not going to make a whole lot of sense to do a whole fiqh lesson right at this very moment. But the broader question that I think is maybe fueling perhaps some of this is the concept of blended families. And I was talking about the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how there were multiple, multiple different people in that household. Particularly, I mean, the one where he, after he's married with the Sitna Khadija, radiallahu anha, and of course there's her children. There are, uh, at the time, like we said, adopted son, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarified that adoption is different than biological children, so Zayd bin Haritha. There is Sitna Baraka that we talked about today. There's also, and then her children <laughs> that come into the picture, right? And then there is, of course, the uh, Sayyidina Ali, so his own cousin, right, who is brought into the household as well, and then his own children. So what I meant by the blended family is that you have so many different, today this is what we call this term, we call it a blended family in which you have different people from different families that are all, or different, uh, you know, that are not necessarily all related to each other who are living in one household. And I think the bigger part of the question here is how do you keep that kind of peaceful atmosphere with so many different types of people? When sometimes, subhanAllah, even with biological people all related to you, it's hard to keep any peace at all, <laughs> subhanAllah. And I think what I'll end on since that, you know, I said the earlier part of references is really has to do with learning the fiqh of the rules, right, the, the actual rules, related to the nuance of your particular family, if you are in a blended family or hope to one day be, you're considering that for yourself, is to definitely seek out your teacher, you know, the fiqh teacher of your community, the, the person who can answer those nuanced questions for you as one important place. Secondly, to learn for yourself too, because this comes down to our own fardain knowledge about, you know, um, it really comes down to understanding lineage and understanding who's related to who and who is a mahram to who, which is really important because then it comes into the rules of do you cover in front of the person, do you not? Is this person considered like your brother, sister, or not? Can I marry them? Can my children marry these people? And so on and so forth. So it's actually pretty important rules here. And they're all taught in the science of fiqh, or Islamic law. So I hope, inshallah, you'll, if it's inspired you to take some of these classes, they are offered. As we were saying, find the opening, inshallah, and the place to, to learn them uh, for yourself. So seek out a teacher who can answer the question for your nuance. 
learn for yourself and take some of the questions, some of the fifth classes yourself, inshallah, if you haven't already. And thirdly, if you are in a blended family or a part of it or have those extended to you that are part of that, do seek out the kind of support and help. And this is my plug, I'll put the plug in again, of kind of getting that therapy and support and help when needed because this is not an easy situation. We said the Prophet's household وسلم, was the most peaceful and happy household of the entire region. They had the Prophet <laughs> right? The one who, the perfect of all creation, who taught us how to be, uh, have the kind of adab and with the kind of wisdom and treatment of each other that today you would call interpersonal relations. If we can learn that prophetic model from the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, all of us would do better. And until that's the case, we all need some help, mashallah. And if you are not able to figure this out on your own, this is where the Quran tells us, ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. That could come in the form of our teachers, our counselors, but potentially also those who've professionally studied marriage and family counseling. That can be in the form of professional therapists who are Muslim, hopefully drawing from the sunnah as well. So that's my plug. And Maristan is in the corner, inshallah. So seek out that kind of support and help. We did get a number of questions about, uh, just big questions about, like, you know, if, uh, if the baby's female and urinates on you, things like that. There's a lot of big questions. I, again, I would just reiterate and say, take a, take a good class. It'll, take, it'll walk you through all of those scenarios, and then you'll feel confident when you're worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think that's one of the best things about uh, taking time to study the basics, especially tahara, because it's everyday stuff, is that you just worship with confidence, and then you don't have that in the background, wondering, am I doing this right? It's just clarity, alhamdulillah. Um, before I ask the speakers to give us ways to contact them, we have two more questions. I used to wear hijab. I don't anymore due to past trauma. I've been contemplating wearing it again, but I have dealt with the past sexual assaults and other trauma. It's difficult to reconcile the trauma with my deen and hijab. Things within the deen can be triggering while I try, while I try to work past it. Uh, your advice. SubhanAllah. This is something I always say to myself, and we all have to do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us always keys for khair and not keys for the opposite. Obviously, I mean, I think, Allahu alam, is that this person, the trauma came from a religious person or quote-unquote practicing person, Allah knows. And this is where the trauma is. This is a very difficult situation. There's no answer will be given in a one minute for this. We need to talk. This person needs definitely counseling, professional counseling. Um, to get over the trauma, and of course Rania is way more professional than me and knowledgeable in this case, but you need to have counseling to get over the trauma itself first. Yes, the trauma is related to, to religion, but also that you have the trauma in there, so this needs to be taken care of. And then the second thing is the hijab related to that, and we need to dig into it, why is that? But if I want to just give a general answer, and it's probably not going to be enough for that person, but for everybody. This is what I will say always. When you have a hard time forgiving someone, which we all have, I always remind myself of this. How many times I have disobeyed Allah? How many major sins I have committed? Major. I'm not talking about minor. Myself. And everybody say the same question. But he still feed me. And he still give me a roof. And he's still waiting for me to say, Astaghfirullah. And he still wants me to go to Jannah. Why I can't do it? If you think this way, it will, the, the, the road for forgiveness will be much easier. And there is a dua in the Quran, actually, which happened as a, Sayyidina Umar used it later on in his khilafah, is, Rabbana la taj'al fi qulubina ghilla lilladhina amanu. Ya Allah, don't put in our hearts any ill feeling, grudges, hate to any of the believers. Anytime you look at someone and that someone, she or he, have hurted you, Allah knows what they did. Say that dua. It works wonder. Because who is going to clear your heart? It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that person definitely needs way more than what I just said. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make a lot of dua to everybody. And you make dua for yourself that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heal you. Healing is, is, is not easy, subhanAllah, unless you're really connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're really at that level where you don't see anything but you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make it easy for her. And then, uh, uh, Sorry. 
So I just... It's in Surah Al-Hashr. It's, it's a half of an ayah. It's وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ It's رَبَّنَا لَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلًّا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ رَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ Ya Allah, don't put in our hearts ill feeling. غِل is, is hatred with anger. Both. لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Toward the believers. So that tells you a believer can hurt you and can lead to a hatred in your heart. And then you say, رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ رَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ You are all merciful. And so I want him to forgive me, then I need to do it with other people. It's in, I, I will check the number, I'll give it to you. I'm sorry? Ayat 10, alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. It's, it's, the dua is in the middle of the verse. It's not in the beginning of the verse. Jazakillah. So we're I'm actually try, dealing with a case where it's, it's not from a Muslim person at all. So there's a different, there's, there's two points in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about hijab. One of it, in Surah Al-Nur, where it's talking about modesty, and in Surah Al-Ahzab, it actually talks about identity. And I think it's important to distinguish the two. Because if, they're, like, I'm just going to... Actually, Dalia Mugahed did research about this. The, the spikes in Islamophobia are actually during presidential elections. It's not actually related to, to terrorist attacks or anything like this, because it is more about the rhetoric. And my, my sister, at the time, when the election was going on back in 2015, 2016, she lived in Kansas. She has four kids. The answer to her, I think, is different from an answer to me. I don't have any kids. This is my job. I live on a college campus. Like, you, you do have to use some judgment if the idea is fear. And if that is the case, because you do have, a, you do have responsibility to protect your own life. Like, this is, <laughs> this is part of our sharia. But even within that, because I, I feel like there's a fear, because hijab affects our identity, Make sure that if, like, like, you can tie it backwards, you can wear a cap, you can do so many different things, because ultimately, at the end of the day, I need to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, I did my best. And because this affects our identity, may Allah protect us, a lot of the times I see someone that would, would take off their hijab and feel like that was what was holding them, and then it feels like everything kind of just let go. So how do I then maintain things and collect them? Because modesty, in and of itself, is, one of, is, a, is a part of our faith. And it sometimes is embodied in hijab, but it's embodied in so many different other ways as well. And I think that's important to, to just to know that. Um, I had another thought, and now it's gone. It's past my bedtime, guys. I'm sorry. No, this was the other thing. It really, really frustrates me in the Muslim community when women are told, you wear hijab so you don't attract the men. This is our act of worship. How they make it about them. Like, I just, I don't understand. <laughs> Hijab is our act of worship to remember we're more important spiritually than we are physically. Your intention in it is important because people in society tell us this is based on your value, and we're like, no, no, I'm more valuable because Allah said I'm valuable. And this is our act of worship, so your intention in it is important. The, there's, a, there's a lot of victim blaming that really makes me mad. That any time there is these, like, un these unfortunate incidents, like, what was she wearing? Who freaking cares? She's not the one that perpetrated a crime. And it just really, really, really makes me mad when people try to associate those two things. We really have to work hard to disassociate those two things because they're idiots online that are seeing these things. And is we have to make sure that we are actually correcting those narratives and that we do actually have healthy relationships with our bodies and healthy relationships with our hijab and we feel spiritually uplifted wearing our hijab. And when someone is struggling with their Muslim identity, that we have grace with them of like, tell me what's going on with you spiritually. I remember I had a student that came to me and she said, I haven't prayed in three months. Do I take off my hijab? I feel like a hypocrite. And I was like, really, I think you should start praying. I don't think you should take off your hijab. They're two separate acts of worship. You don't know what brings you back to Allah. And can you imagine someone be like, well, if you didn't pray, look, you might as well not pray us. That doesn't make sense. You do as much as you can on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hadith the Prophet says, Saddidu wa qaribu. Just really fill as many of the gaps as you can. Get as close as you can. None of us are making it to Jannah because they did it all. Nobody. We make it to Jannah because Allah is merciful. Including the Prophet Like really, can anyone worship like him? 
And he said, إِلَّا أَنْ يَتَقَمَّدَنِي بِرَحْمَتِهِ Except that Allah envelops me in His mercy. SubhanAllah. You know, nobody is deserving. Allah is generous. SubhanAllah. Sorry, I know I went on a rant, but I just... May Allah protect us all. Uh, yes. Um, we're going to just do a... Tell us how you, can con how you can be contacted. So just how can we contact you after today? On our on the Stanford website. My, my email's on there. I'm so sorry. Are you on social media too? Okay, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. So the easiest way to contact me is uh, Instagram or Facebook, although as the Madhya said, who's on Facebook anymore? No, I'm kidding. I'm still there, but I'm much more active on Instagram. Um, and then my email, events.hosai, my first name, at gmail.com. It's always open as well. I'm notoriously difficult to contact. I really don't do social media. If you send me a message on Facebook, I'll never read it. Because um, it goes into that other inbox. You know, like if you're not friends with someone, everyone's like, what the heck is Facebook? Um, I don't do Instagram or TikTok or any of that stuff. Um, so if you really want to get in contact with me, send me an email. It's my first name, dot my last name at gmail.com. Make sure you spell Fasena and Muhammad the way I spell Fasena and Muhammad. Otherwise, I don't know who it's going to. Um, <laughs> so it's F-U-S-E-I-N-A dot M-O-H-A-M-A-D at gmail.com. Okay, if you spell either of those wrong, Allahu <laughs> A'lam. Inshallah. Um, inshallah, you can get hold of me through the different organizations that I'm part of. So whether it's um, Madistan or whether through the Rahma Foundation, um, or just come see me on Friday nights, inshallah, once we start our halakas back <laughs> next month, inshallah ta'ala. Um, also, like the others that have the social media accounts that I was very much dragged into, <laughs> there are, there are uh, messages that are checked, not often by myself, but are checked there um, that you can send to, and inshallah, we'll try to get back to you, bithnillah. But just know that it is a team of people that are getting back to those. So everything's kept confidential, but you are able to reach there. I know some people have asked about trying to find emails. I'm notoriously bad with emails, but if you do send through the DMs, the direct messages or send through the organizations that then forward, hopefully you'll be able to reach me with the love. But it's much better to just find me in person. <laughs> I look forward to seeing you all on Friday nights, inshallah. Uh, you could send me a message on at the Miriam Amir, T H E M A R Y A M A M I R. That's on Instagram um, or TikTok. Uh, but more importantly, you can also simply connect with my app. <laughs> it uh, has a QR, QR code here. <laughs> Anyone who hasn't downloaded it can simply take a screenshot, and you can download it right now. <laughs> so go ahead and do that. Shala, let me know if you want to have one of these. <laughs> take them to your communities. Take them to your local halal shops, anywhere you'd like. It's free. Inshallah, next year it's going to be interactive where you can recite with the Qariyas, inshallah. Can I also say that I spent like my entire Ramadan listening to the Qari'a app. Like it was literally so beautiful to recite along with other women who are reciting. It reminded me so much of my days spent in Syria with women who are hafad of the Quran and hafidat of the Quran and women who are leading in prayer. Like that was our, that was, that was our reality all the time. And I was not, I was telling Ustadha Maryam, I didn't realize how many women have never actually experienced that because they haven't met women who have memorized the Qur'an and who lead prayer with women, that is. And, or just even like Qiyam al we do them at the Rahma Foundation, hopefully all of you have enjoyed them. But also here, right in this very room over here, we've spent so many nights all night long in Qiyam, all with women reciters. But what do you do when you're home alone? The Qari'a app. Alhamdulillah. So please do download that. I think it's so worth your time, inshallah. Yeah, alaikum. Um, you can find me, I'm sure you can. Um, if you can reach me through email, it's Dr. Haifa at jannahinstitute.org. You can find me on Instagram, it's Dr. Sheikha Haifa Yunus, uh, that's you will find there. You can send me a message. I'll do my best to answer. I, I don't promise it's going to be right away. So please forgive me. If you call me, good luck. If you text me, another good luck, right? Um, but may Allah make it easy. I mean, you all have to know that we have so many things to do, right? Um, go and visit our website, jannahinstitute.com.